Normally, we are not fans of doing the standard SpaceX Starship S8 hop imminent videos. But after the last successful static fire test from the 24th of November, Elon confirmed that the 15km test flight will indeed happen next week. But what is different now? Why should we believe Elon this time? And how high are the chances for a successful flight? Apart from Starship, we have a small update on the Crew-1 mission and SpaceX had another successful Starlink launch. Then in non-SpaceX news, which happens admittedly rarely these days, the Chinese have launched their most ambitious moon mission to date, which will bring back samples from the moon for the first time since 1976. So let's analyze the Chinese moon ambitions a bit. A lot to talk about, so stay tuned. Okay, we are starting to have a good feeling about this. You know that we are always a bit more on the conservative side when it comes to Elon's already optimistic timelines. We kind of ranted a bit about it a few weeks ago, that everyone keeps doing those Starship Hop Soon videos, and the hop just keeps getting postponed. But this time, it really looks as if the famous 15km test flight is indeed going to happen next week. There are a few very strong arguments that Starship SNH will actually fly next week. Now we have the latest round of static fire testing with three Raptor engines. And this time, everything went well. You might still remember that the previous static fire with three Raptor engines went really not well and almost resulted in the destruction of SN8, if not for the heroic sacrifice of one noble burst disc, which saved SN8 in one of the most epic deeds of human spaceflight history. Thank you, dear burst disc. You will not be forgotten, we promise. This time though, everything went well, as you can see on this spectacular shot by the awesome Mary aka Boca Chica Gal from nasaspaceflight.com. Please also go and check out their YouTube channel, because their work is really invaluable to us space nerds. Link to the channel in the video description. As you can see, the static fire test just went flawlessly this time. So flawless that Elon came forth on Twitter saying that this was a good SN8 static fire and that the first 15km hop would take place next week. The goals are to test the ascent to 15km with all three engines, with body flaps of course, then transitioning from main to header tanks, and then ultimately the skydive, belly flop, and finally the landing flip. And this is not just talk, but we have actual official road closure dates from Cameron County, which we already showed in the last video, but here they are again, and it clearly says SN8 15 km flight with the primary date Monday the 30th of November and backup closure dates the 1st and 2nd of December. So it really seems to be happening this time. I think this warrants a small Ron Paul happening meme. Come on, we haven't used it for a long time now. Now, when asked on Twitter how high Elon thinks the chances are for a successful hop, so meaning that SN8 would land in one piece, Elon replied about one in three. So we shouldn't be sad if SN8 doesn't make it back in one piece or experiences an unscheduled rapid disassembly of sorts. The chances for that to happen are, according to Elon, higher than everything going well. Also, interestingly, he said that should SN8 not make it, SN9 and SN10 are the backups and would be waiting in line to quickly take over the testing campaign. And indeed, the SN9 has now been fully stacked, as we can see here, so we now have two fully stacked Starship prototypes, complete with rear and forward flaps. So indeed, SN9 could quickly take over should SN8 fail. So, considering all these points, we are really optimistic that first, the 15km hop will this time really happen next week, and that second, should the test fail, SN9 will be ready to quickly take over so that we won't have to endure long waiting times until the next high altitude test flights can continue. Because perfecting the skydive, belly flop and landing maneuver is an absolutely crucial part of the whole Starship project. 
And please subscribe to our channel because we don't only talk about Starship normally, but we also often rant against Boeing or Lockheed and other companies that rely heavily on government subsidies and lobbying to achieve their means. But we really need your support to make a difference and expose the corruption and lobbying which is going on in the spaceflight industry which is ultimately hindering the technological progress of humanity. So thank you very much in advance for your support. Apart from Starship, other things that SpaceX is doing are of course the flights to the ISS with Crew Dragon, where the Crew-1 launch two weeks ago was picture perfect again. The astronauts Mike Hopkins, Victor Glover, and Shannon Walker of NASA, and Soichi Noguchi of the Japan Aerospace Exploration Agency, JAXA, discuss their launch and flight on the SpaceX Crew Dragon with the crew name Resilience during an in-flight news conference on November 19th aboard the ISS. The conference is really worth a watch. And we found the coolest passage when Soichi Noguchi was asked how the Crew Dragon compares to the other vehicles with which he had already flown to space before. And his short answer is this one here. Hey Chris, uh, thanks for the question. For the record, uh, the Dragon is the best. It's a short answer. <laughs> and of course, each uh, vehicle has its own, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, peculiarity. But uh, I feel Dragon is really ready to go up. It's really, uh, it's fun to fun to ride. And uh, two days and uh, Dragon is really remarkable memories. So I'm uh, really uh, happy to be here again. That probably says it all. Another area where SpaceX shines forth like a radiant flame amidst the darkness sorry I just recently reread Tolkien's Silmarillion uh, is Starlink. Well, we had another successful Starlink launch on November 24th, upping the number of working Starlink satellites deployed to orbit to an incredible 955. The Starlink beta is going on with the official launch early next year. We talked about the speed of Starlink and initial pricing in this video here. But what makes Starlink so extremely important for SpaceX is of course the really high revenue it will create in the next years. Elon himself estimated that Starlink will generate around $30 billion of annual revenue by 2025, when the satellite constellation will be fully deployed. This is more than NASA's annual budget, mind you, which currently stands at $23.5 billion. So if Starlink will be successful and everything points to it being successful, then SpaceX will have huge funds at their disposal. And we all know what SpaceX could achieve with huge funds, don't we? Even with a fraction of these funds, SpaceX already accomplished this year, and this year, and this year, and soon this year. Oh, and the operating profit margins of Starlink are by the way estimated to be as high as 60%. So with such financials, SpaceX will easily have enough funds to really propel the Starship project to the Moon and Mars and accelerate our progress to become a species that lives on multiple bodies of the solar system, with a focus on the Moon and Mars at first, of course. SpaceX will have so much money that they will just be able to buy other companies which might have interesting technologies which could be valuable for our future settlement of the Moon and Mars. The same way as Tesla acquired Maxwell Technologies for example, which are now a crucial part of Tesla's battery strategy, the same way SpaceX could just buy any company with interesting technology that would be useful for the future settlements on the Moon and Mars. Oh, you produce expandable habitats? Bought. Oh, you're developing a compact radiothermal power source? Bought. Oh, you're developing 3D printed habitat modules with radiation shielding? Bought. Many of the other necessary systems will of course be provided by Elon's other companies, Tesla for solar power, battery systems and pressurized rovers, boring company for underground shelters and resource mining, and possibly even Neuralink to alleviate the psychological burden of long spaceflight journeys, an idea about which we talked in this video here. But that is why we like to mention Starlink so often, because it will eventually enable our interplanetary future. Meanwhile, the Chinese are also quite busy. On Monday, November 23rd, China successfully launched their Chang'e 5 moon mission. This is an unmanned probe 
which will bring back Luna rock samples for the first time since the Soviet probe Luna 24 in 1976. The Chinese mission consists of a lander and a rover, and of course the lander has an ascent stage, which shoots the rock samples back into moon orbit after successful retrieval of the moon samples. In moon orbit, the mothership is waiting and will return the samples back to Earth. The whole mission is scheduled to last 23 days, although the rover has imaging capabilities and will remain active even after the main mission of collecting the rock samples is over. If successful, this will be another really important milestone for the Chinese moon program. They already landed for the first time a probe on the moon with Chang'e 3 in 2013. The pictures of the small rover Yu 2 translated Jade Rabbit went around the world. In January 2019, China landed the Chang'e 4 mission on the far side of the moon. It also has a small rover in addition to the lander, the rover being named Yu 2 2, so the successor of the first one from the Chang'e 3 mission. And fascinatingly, the rover is still active on the moon, roving around and collecting scientific data as we speak. The rover has now been operating on the moon for nearly 700 Earth days and covered a distance of 590 meters. So a successful Chinese lunar Zambo return mission would add another giant success to this long line of Chinese lunar landing successes. And ultimately, we of course all know that China wants to land astronauts, which they call Taikonauts, on the moon by 2030 and subsequently build a moon base. That's why it's absolutely imperative that NASA and the West also have an answer, ideally landing people on the moon and building a moon base before China. But we all know the inefficiency of government, NASA being a puppet of US Congress and all. This is where we think SpaceX will play a pivotal role in building us that moon base, which we were promised already 50 years ago. We believe that SpaceX will certainly land lots of starships and astronauts on the moon before China. But it's still impressive to see China make such progress, and competition leads to more advancement, which we welcome. And we would like to take this opportunity to thank a few people who have contributed a lot to this channel here. And who have helped us very much. So first, we want to thank Frimrick, Jay Keegan, Another Space Nut, and Warhawk for their amazing help as moderators in our latest live stream. Then we'd like to thank Michael Rood for his excellent work on our new website. And we'd also like to thank Starbucks Jure, sorry for certainly mispronouncing your name, for helping us with the YouTube subtitles. And thanks to his help, we probably will be able to now upload all videos with subtitles, hopefully. And of course, we are also extremely grateful for every PayPal donation we have ever received. And we have sent out a personal thank you email to everyone who has donated to us. However, those emails often seem to land in the spam folder. So be sure to check your spam folder because you might have emails lying around from us in your spam folder thanking you for your generous donations. So thanks for watching the JS Space Report. And I would say, on to the future.